Greetings to everyone present. My name is Ankit Malhotra. I am the co-founder and president of the Jindal Society of International Law. And to speak today about a very special topic, we have two titans, two legends, two giants, the field of international law and the Holy See. But before I speak about that, I think it is evident, my excitement of this topic is evident given my, given my research and also reverence for our speakers. But before I speak about that, let me just speak a few words about the Jindal Society of International Law, which is a student-led initiative under the aegis of the Center for the Study of United Nations under the expert guidance of Professor Dr. Weston Dubowski. The society was founded in 2020 on the 18th day of November by the Herbert and Rose Rubin Professor of International Law at New York University, Professor Jose Enrique Alvarez, along with our respected Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, and a very dear friend of the society and center, Professor Dr. Mohan Kumar. The purpose of this society is to increase the student engagement with the subject matter of international law through its various initiatives. Rather than being primarily research driven, we intend to offer a host of experiences that contribute towards skill building, thereby increasing the knowledge database available to students and members of the society. The society is also an attempt to bridge the lacuna by streamlining resources and inculcating an overall interest in the vast expanses of international law. We aim to provide a young space to international law enthusiasts to nurture their interests in this field. Thus, through the spring lecture series entitled Colloquium on Challenges to Global Governance and in Humanity and of the Humanities of the 21st Century, we offer a compendium of scholarship from the bar and also experience of teaching and writing from the academy. Over the past years, the Jindal Society of International Law has hosted over 100 renowned speakers from foreign universities, the International Law Commission, international law firms, United Nations, the Hague Academy of International Law, and the Institut de Droit International. Through our previous series, we endeavored to study the different contours of international law through the speakers who cover and address their respective areas of expertise based upon their years of research and also practice. Given the vast ecosystems and the engagement of international law in it, the society aimed to study the fragmentation and fertilization of the various disciplines in this ecosystem of public and private international law. Over the past year, the society has become a quorum of thought-provoking discussions due to its engagements with the experts aimed at exploring this ecosystem of international law. Thus, as a result, through the spring lecture series, it is important to understand the law from its broader, different, and differing vantage points. Acknowledging that law is a creation of states, it is also important to understand and appreciate the social sciences and humanities that have played a key role in shaping this law. Thus, the series it is also hoped that one will develop a deeper understanding of Philip Jessup's magnum opus, A Modern Law of Nations and Introduction, which he wrote in 1949, when he said, and I quote him, so long as the international community is composed of states, it is only through an exercise of their will as expressed through treaty or agreement or as laid down by an international authority deriving its power from states that a rule of law becomes binding, end quote. And to speak perhaps on one of the most integral, important and binding authority, which is the Holy See and also international law, which is formed or assisted in formulating, we today have amongst us Professor Dr. Cedric Reingart. Professor Reingart is the Chair of Public International Law at Utrecht University and the Head of Department at the International Law and European Law at the University's Law School. His research interests relate to the law of jurisdiction, immunities, non-state actors, the role of international law before domestic courts, sanctions, international responsibility, and international organizations. Among a few publications of his, he authored Jurisdiction in International Law and a Selfless Intervention, the Exercise of Jurisdiction in the Common, common, law, common Interest. He is a member of the Dutch Advisory Council on International Law and Editor-in-Chief of the Utrecht Law Review and the Netherlands International Law Review. Previously, he taught at the Leuven Institute and the Military Academy of Belgium. We also have amongst us Dr. Sharon Mills, who has recently received her PhD from Utrecht University's Department of Law, Economics and Governance in the Netherlands. Her dissertation research applied a transdisciplinary approach to examine documentary evidence that illustrates the Holy See's universal moral authority activity in the United Nations. 
a transnational legal theory of authority was used, observed through a historical lens of religious institutions, joint spiritual temporal rule with past empires to ascertain the Holy See's contemporary practices and objectives in the United Nations. Our research conclusions indicate that the Holy See utilizes essentially the same formula for acquiring power in the United Nations as it has throughout history by asserting moral supremacy over governmental decisions. I will stop here because I would like her to speak about this and also share her findings on the topic on which she invested so much time, effort and sweat. With those words, I now invite Professor Rangash to share his presentation, after which we'll hear from Dr. Mills. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for uh, the uh, kind words and the introduction and for uh, inviting us here. I assume that you can see this presentation. Yes, yes. so I see Ankit uh, nodding, so that's great. Now, um, let me start uh, my presentation perhaps by giving you a contemporary example um, of the role played uh, by the Holy See in international relations, and that concerns uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, very current events, um, obviously. So on, on, on various occasions, uh, the Pope has spoken out um, against the war in Ukraine, uh, but it's quite interesting um, that he didn't name Russia as such or Vladimir Putin as such. Uh, there's a, um, uh, there was a, a meeting uh, between the Pope, Pope Francis I, and, and his counterpart from the Orthodox Church, Patrick Kirill of Mos Moscow. So Francis I then says, wars are always unjust since it is the people of God who pay. So in a rather general fashion, not naming Putin. So this was uh, later rationalized uh, by the official newspaper um, of uh, the Vatican, uh, L'Osservatore Romano, on the 21st of March, um, in saying in a general sense that, that popes tend to avoid naming specific aggressors, not because they're cowards or they're too prudent, uh, but in order not to close the door for a diplomatic solution, uh, basically to stop evil and to save human life. So that's uh, more or less the official position, you could say then, um, of the Vatican. Now, in the New York Times, there's a very interesting reflective piece published a few day days later, um, acknowledging uh, the conundrum in which the Vatican finds itself here. Uh, the Pope has to walk a fine line between, let's say, different imperatives, uh, being a global moral or religious conscience, but also being a diplomatic player in its own right, and then thirdly being, well, a religious leader who is also responsible for Catholics all over the world, including Catholics in Ukraine and in Russia. So you don't know, want uh, Russian Catholics to be the victim of uh, the Pope taking sides uh, um, against um, Russia. I think that was the concern. But this led to some criticism quite quickly, and, and a comparison was made a bit unfairly um, um, with Pope Pius XII, who was uh, um, at, at one point dubbed uh, as Hitler's Pope, be because he didn't really spoke out, uh, speak out uh, against Hitler. Um, and uh, he was seen not really as complicit in the Holocaust, but uh, at least he should have done more to rescue the Jews who perished in the Holocaust. That was the idea. Again, the criticism was a bit unfair also towards uh, Pope Pius the, the, the XII, because uh, afterwards it transpired that he, he had done uh, a lot, in fact, behind the scenes. But um, in the open, um, he uh, remained, well, neutral, you could say. So there was this critique um, of, uh, of the current Pope Francis I, and somehow he, he has been susceptible to that critique. Um, I don't know, but if, if you look at what he said just last uh, Saturday, um, Francis I, when he was attending a conference in Malta, he was suddenly referring, again, not to Putin as such, but to some potentate who had unleashed a threat of nuclear war, talking about aggression, about nationalistic interests and so on. It is clear that he's talking here about Russia and he's even talking about Vladimir Putin. He's not talking about Zelensky or 
anyone else. So that is quite interesting, and I would say it's even unusual, and, and possibly it may scuttle his chances to act uh, as a mediator uh, between Ukraine and Russia. But perhaps as a moral actor, um, uh, the Pope needs uh, to do this, to, needs to identify evil uh, when he sees it and speak out. Um, I have another slide here also in relation to uh, the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, you know that uh, the Vatican, uh, the Holy See, they have diplomatic representatives, they call nuncios, papal nuncios, which have also been recognized in the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations for that matter. Well, there is a papal nuncio to Ukraine. Interestingly, this papal nuncio uh, called Archbishop Kulbokas, I think he's originally from Lithuania, he stayed in Kiev, um, well, during uh, the bombardments, uh, now of course the Russians have uh, temporarily withdrawn, uh, but over the last month, two months, uh, it was quite something to remain um, in Kiev, bearing in mind uh, that many other diplomats had actually withdrawn uh, from Kiev, had left Kiev, had moved to Lviv, or sometimes even outside of Ukraine. And this um, um, has been oh, this has been justified on the basis of solidarity of, of the global uh, Catholic community with the suffering uh, of the Ukrainian uh, people. So this is the reason why he stayed uh, in, in Ukraine, very courageous. Um, I would say, and you see, it's not really a church uh, where uh, this uh, picture has been taken. So uh, he was celebrating mass in his kitchen uh, because the church uh, was not a safe place. It could be bombarded. Uh, so uh, this is the way he did it. Uh, he invited people to his kitchen or he was live streaming, live streaming it from a kitchen, from the kitchen. I don't know exactly, uh, but a very courageous act uh, of staying uh, throughout um, the war. OK, so uh, let me now turn to um, some more uh, legal issues and I will stop sharing my screen and in a minute. So what I'm going to tackle now in I think the, the next uh, 10 minutes or so is um, the international legal status of the Holy See. I will first address um, um, the, um, the categorization um, of the Holy See versus um, the Vatican. What kind of entities are these, states or non-state actors? Second, I will say a few things about the role of the Holy See in international relations, a bit of international dispute settlement, and then I will address immunities. Now, regarding immunities, we've had quite an interesting case here in Europe before the European Court of Human Rights in relation to um, allegations of sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. That was a case in Belgium, which uh, uh, then reached the court, European Court in Strasbourg, where immunity of the Holy See was upheld. But there's clearly a tension here. Um, with human rights, uh, the right of access uh, to a court. So that is also something that I'm going to discuss in the next few minutes. So I will stop sharing my screen so you can see me a bit um, better. All right. Um, the international legal status um, um, of the Holy See. I think there is little doubt uh, that the Holy See um, has international legal personality. Um, but international legal personality is really a placeholder. I mean, the most important question is obviously what rights and obligations uh, does the Holy See have? Um, and then first, obviously, we need to disentangle uh, this uh, Vatican uh, City um, uh, from uh, the Holy See. Um, now, my position is uh, that the Vatican um, uh, is a state, um, but that the Holy See is not uh, a state, right? Uh, so the Vatican, uh, in my view, is um, what I would call a, a microstate, a state in its own right that meets the so-called Montevideo criteria for statehood. It has a territory, however small. It has a population, uh, just a few thousand people, but still, and it has a government with constitutional autonomy, the Roman Curia, and in fact, the Holy See. So the Holy See is also the government of the Vatican, 
But the Holy See is much more than that. The Vatican is actually only the territorial base of the Holy See, but the Holy See is the nerve center of a universal religious organization called the Catholic Church, which has 1.2 billion um, adherents of one of the largest uh, religions in the world. And by the way, there are about uh, 20 million Catholics in India, so that's quite uh, sizable, but uh, all in all, it, that's only 1.5% of the total population uh, of India, uh, counting more than 1 billion people, um, as, you, as you know. But the Catholic Church, uh, as I understand it, is the single largest Christian church in India. So that's uh, perhaps also interesting to know uh, for our audience. Now, given its global spiritual mission and remit, I would say that the Holy See, compared to the Vatican, is the more important organization and, and legal person. But this Holy See is not a state. It's a non-state actor with a sui generis international legal personality with rights and obligations that somehow resemble the rights and obligations of states, but uh, that need not coincide with state rights and obligations. Now, inter interestingly, uh, both the Vatican and the Holy See engage as legal persons in international relations. Both of them have joined international organizations and have ratified treaties. So it's confusing in a way, but what we see is that the Holy See typically takes responsibility for more value-laden matters like uh, human rights, peace and security, disarmament, and so on. And the Vatican, as a state, and I would say, takes responsibility for the bread and butter issues of statehood, more technical matters on telecommunications, and so on. And so uh, you see a bit of a division of labor, I would say. It's interesting that the Holy See is accredited with the United Nations. In itself, that's not surprising, but it's accredited as an, obser as an observer state. And so somehow um, the United Nations considers the Holy See as a state, although I would say that the Holy See does not consider itself to be a state. It has not pushed as such for statehood. You can also see that in the reports that it files with the Committee on the Rights of the Child, so where it basically says that it is a universal spiritual organization, right? And what is important here is that the Holy See actively participates in the work of various international institutions. There's also quite a long-standing practice of diplomatic relations um, between the Holy See and other states, which is recognized by the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, as I already alluded to. By the way, there are formal diplomatic relations between India and the Holy See have been in place since the very independence uh, of India in 1948. The Pope has visited India, as I understand it, three times, but the last time is quite a long time ago. That was John Paul II's visit to New Delhi in 1999. Now, with some Catholic states, um, the Holy See sometimes enters into so-called concordats, concordats um, or bilateral agreements, uh, which govern the position of the Catholic Church in those states, for instance, that a religious marriage also has civil effects. So that's uh, something typical that you could find in the Concorda. Um, with 25 states, I believe, the Holy See has such agreements. It's also of note, and, and that relates to what I discussed earlier in my presentation, is, is that the Holy See sometimes um, plays uh, the role of a settler of international disputes. Not really in a judicial sense, of course, they're not a court, but as a mediator, as a diplomatic media mediator, for instance, in the crisis between Russia and Ukraine, perhaps that won't work out, but uh, we have uh, quite a number of examples from the Pope mediating in disputes uh, between majority Catholic countries, for instance, in Latin America. Now, in any event, um, the Holy See has a special position in international law. The Holy See and the Pope have an important voice in international relations. And I would say 
when the Pope speaks, the world listens. It is also widely reported in the media when the Pope speaks up, for instance, in relation to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Now, this is far less the case with other religions. It's interesting to make that comparison. Most of these other religions uh, are far less centrally organized uh, than the Catholic Church, uh, like the, the Protestant Church, for instance, or Islam. Now, I don't know much about uh, Hinduism, I have to admit, but I also understand that it is uh, a religion, if you can call it so, that is not that centrally organized either. But I'm, of course, um, uh, very happy to learn more about this. Now, the Pope has a lot of influence. It's something that we have to admit, but that is also partly because of the Eurocentrism of international law. So the Holy See was able over the centuries, uh, and I think Sharon can say much more about that, was able to carve out this special legal position for itself during a time that international law was still very much a law um, of the European Christian states. Yeah, uh, so maybe that's also something that we can reserve for, for a critical discussion after the presentations. Let me now move to the third part of my presentation. And the third part of my presentation is about the immunity of the Holy See. Immunity is, as we know, an aspect of an entity's international legal personality. Now, this is a somewhat contested issue, whether the Holy See enjoys immunity from jurisdiction, meaning the jurisdiction of domestic courts, can it be sued before domestic courts? Now, this is an issue that has recently played a prominent role in respect of the sexual abuse scandals that have rocked the Catholic Church. Cases have been brought against bishops, dioceses, individual clergymen, and so on, Investigations commissions have been set up. I don't know uh, what's the state of play in India, but this is definitely the case um, in, in, in Western Europe, also in the United States, Australia, Canada. Uh, but then the question has arisen whether the Holy See as a separate legal entity, um, more than the sum of its parts, you could say, could the Holy See be sued before domestic courts because of negligent behavior in respect of, in a way, tolerating sexual abuse by individual clergymen. Some cases have been brought in the United States. That was about 10, 15 years ago when that um, had been tried. Um, and, well, that was not very successful for the plaintiffs. Um, U.S. courts have basically equated the Holy See to a state, and then they applied the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Immunities Act and conferred immunity on the Holy See. After that, um, victims tried in European states. Um, they started in Belgium about 10, 10 years ago, and that finally led to an important case before the European Court of Human Rights. Quite a number of blog posts have already been written on this in English. I myself also wrote a blog post on the Völkerrechts blog, for those who are interested, uh, it's open access. The case is known as JC versus Belgium. The judgment itself is unfortunately only available in French. So you need to speak French to have access um, to the primary materials. And this is of course, because uh, the case is a Belgian case, although it was decided by a Dutch speaking court um, in Belgium. But ultimately, um, the takeaway uh, of this case uh, was that the Holy See enjoys immunity in relation to sexual abuse. And the court said, this is not a disproportionate restriction of the victims, the plaintiff's right of access to a court. And in essence, the courts equated the Holy See to a state for purposes of the law of state immunity, and they applied um, basically the UN Convention on State Immunity, which has not formally entered into force, uh, but still it's a codification of the customary law of state immunity. And that was considered as relevant, equally relevant for the position of the Holy See. Now, I would say that this is contestable because as, as I said earlier, the Holy See is not a state. It's a non-state actor. 
Now, of course, a non-state actor could enjoy immunity, like international organizations, for instance. They also enjoy immunity on the basis of treaties. So you would need to identify treaties. There is, of course, a Lateran Treaty of the 1920s, but it doesn't formally talk um, about uh, immunity from jurisdiction. Alternatively, of course, you have customary international law, and then you need to have sufficient proof of virtually uniform state practice. But I'm not fully convinced whether that proof is there, because there's simply not that much state practice out there. Some practice is only relevant for domestic law purposes, for that matter, for instance, the US practice. But we should admit that some states, and I would say especially Catholic um, states or, or states with a Catholic uh, majority or a, or a strong Catholic minority, they do treat um, the Holy See as if it were a state, right? So possibly among those countries, there might be a regional customary international law norm on the immunity of the Holy See. Now, if you believe that in principle, the Holy See enjoys immunity, well, there might be relevant exceptions. The same applies in respect of state immunity. Article 5 of the convention says there is state immunity basically for sovereign acts, but then there are exceptions for commercial acts or acts um, that uh, look like commercial or private law character. And the relevant provision there. Um, is the so-called territorial tort exception in Article 12 of the UN Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities, which says that a foreign state, or in our case, the Holy See, cannot invoke its immunity in relation to tortious acts which took place on the territory of the foreign state and are attributable to it. Now, my legal intuition says that, well, these acts of sexual abuse, I mean, these kids uh, were abused, not in the Vatican, right? They were abused on the territory of Belgium. Eh? So the first criterion is met, you would say. The second criterion is about attribution. Now, these acts are committed by clergymen. Now, I would say clergymen, priests, bishops, and so on, these people are organs of the Catholic Church whose acts should normally be attributable to the Holy See, which means that the exception of Article 12 is relevant. Kicks in should be applied and the immunity um, should be dismissed. But the European Court of Human Rights um, reasoned differently. Basically, it ruled that the relevant act of the Holy See was the failure to act, not the abuse itself in Belgium, but the failure to act, its negligence, which was located not in Belgium, but, well, in the Vatican, in the nerve center uh, of the Holy See. And it also ruled that acts of these Catholic clergymen were not attributable to the Holy See, as under canon law, and I'm not a specialist in canon law, I have to admit, um, but bishops, according to the Belgian courts as well, bishops are not organs of the Holy See, even though the Holy See or the Catholic Church um, is centrally organized. These bishops have a measure of autonomy. So there is no principal agent relationship, to cost it in legal terms, between the Holy See and the bishops uh, uh, within whose, well, remit, you could say, the abuse took place. So the acts of the priests could not be attributed to the Holy See. Huh? So uh, that was then considered relevant for purposes of immunity. Now, I don't find that fully persuasive, um, and I believe that more justification might be needed. In a way, I find the judgment uh, a bit of a missed opportunity, um, although it is still possible that the Grand Chamber uh, of the European Court of Human Rights We'll look at this. So uh, the applicants uh, filed a motion um, uh, for the Grand Chamber uh, to uh, reflect on this. Um, and uh, let's see whether something comes out of that. In any event, it means that um, cases against the Holy See can no longer be brought in the uh, area of the European Convention on Human Rights. And I doubt whether they could actually be brought elsewhere, perhaps in Australia, um, that is 
maybe um, a possibility under domestic Australian law. And I would also be interested in knowing what uh, the possibilities would be in, in India or under Indian law. I would leave it at that for the moment, and I'm happy to give the floor to Sharon Mills. Ma'am, would you like to share a slice, please? Okay, am I um, set with my screen sharing? Yes, uh, we see the Holy See as Transnational Model Authority Act in the UN. Is that the first slide? It is. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. So good evening to everyone, or um, I guess some of you may be um, in the daytime as I am. Um, so good morning. Uh, first, thanks to Ankit for welcoming me to take part in this very interesting lecture series, which I'm proud to be a part of. I'm going to, to be discussing my um, topic on the Holy See as a Transnational Moral Authority Actor in the UN, which Ankit um, gave a, a, a quick version of. And um, this was, as you said, the subject of my PhD dissertation, which I recently defended in December of last year. Um, I might add under the wise and capable leadership of Professor Ryan Gart as my advisor. So in my lecture, I'll touch upon four aspects of my research. First, I'll contextualize my research within the discussion of the Holy See as an international legal personality. And I'll explain why I assumed, uh, although I accept that premise, uh, why I assumed a different and a broader transdisciplinary perspective by basing my legal analysis of the Holy See on transnational legal, legal theory. And within that context, uh, I'll describe what my research revealed according to the empirical evidence. And finally, I'll present some of the conclusions of my research. So to contextualize, uh, we can see that a key focus of the modern legal analysis, uh, analysis of the Holy See necessarily concerns the Holy See's institutional accountability for clerical sex abuse cases using legal personality in order to address issues of immunity. Uh, in the UN, we also see this application uh, to the Holy See's conduct in reference to its committee compliance to certain conventions, which it is signed and, and ratified as a state party. Um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Convention Against Torture being two of them, uh, in these situations, scrutiny of the Holy See is based on analysis of legal personality, treating it as a state, uh, with the Holy See asserting the privilege of immunity, just as with cases undergoing judicial scrutiny in the European Court of Human Rights, which Cedric discussed. Uh, however, in general, discussion of the Holy See's legal personality as a symbol of sovereign state identity is, is rare in the United Nations. And even though there's no settled consensus, as again, Cedric met, uh, mentioned, to best characterize this complex of characters, meaning the Holy See and um, the Vatican City State, uh, its rights under international law um, are essentially uh, agreed to by most scholars that the entity indeed, indeed has a very high, highly unusual sui generis status, which ends up causing a, a, a lot of confusion in trying to unravel their individual identities. So although I don't base my analysis of the Holy See's UN activity on legal personality, I do agree with the assessment that's offered by Cedric as the best interpretation of the Holy See Vatican City State duo 
and accept the conclusions that the Holy See and Vatican City State uh, are, are very uh, involved in a confused entanglement and that the Holy See does meet the criteria of a state, albeit quite tiny, and that the Holy See is indeed a non-state international legal personality with its personality arising from the church's global spiritual reach. And also I recognize that the Holy See acts as administrative head of both the church and the state. And by the way, in my lecture, uh, I'll use the term Holy See to refer to the amalgam of characters throughout my discussion. So with this in mind, uh, what my research shows is that the Holy See operates as both a universal moral authority and a state in the United Nations. And here I, I'd like to uh, capsulize my research. Um, so what we find in the UN is that the Holy See makes very effective use of this decidedly confusing but unique legal understanding of its dual status by reserving recognition of both of these recognized roles in the UN. It exercises either one of these status depending on the situation and the benefits that might accrue to it from assuming either as its primary identification. In essence, the Holy See tries to wear two hats depending on the situation. And yet it's interesting that when it's not defending against its political liabilities as a head of state, thereby needing the protection that's offered by this immunity privilege it affirmatively chooses to completely disassociate from any recognition as a sovereign state. In fact, the Holy See has remained a UN observer state in the UN with no voting rights in the General Assembly. And it's done this for more than 60 years uh, since, since its entry into the UN in 1964. It declares that it does this in order to maintain absolute neutrality so that it can judiciously offer moral guidance to the political decision-making authority of the United Nations. <clears throat> Nevertheless, it says that it has the right to acquire full voting member seat in the General Assembly at any time as all other UN members, which is subject to dispute, of course. In my research, I use both United Nations and Vatican documents to look for evidence that might explain this preferential recognition of authority status over and above the expression of sovereignty. And what I found was complete consistency between my two sources of evidentiary material, both of which overwhelmingly reflected the Holy See's desire for this primary acknowledgement as an authority figure. Evidence from hundreds of documents supported this conclusion uh, with the UN and its member states largely accepting this premise, which is a very interesting uh, situation. I found that the Holy See only asserts statehood under two conditions. The first being as a vehicle for its religious independence in the exercise of its spiritual mission and the second, when it's necessary to assert the privilege of immunity for wrongs committed. This, of course, results in confusion concerning its U activity and its specific identity. Is the Holy See a necessarily biased political sovereign, just like any other UN member state? Or is it a highly, excuse me, is it a higher authority actor above states? who purports to exercise a neutral and equal voice of moral authority for all humanity? Should the UN be permitting it to be both? So what, what does this tell us about the Holy See's objectives, objectives in the United Nations? But before I discuss its objectives, um, we should assume several important historical background facts of the Holy See's ancient partnerships with leaders of imperial governance. 
The Holy See has a very long history of governing the medieval world with empires. And throughout the medieval era, when Christianity was cultivating its authority, popes divided the world into two spheres of authority or orders of influence that being the spiritual and the temporal, which together they ruled the known universe. These two powers reflected the moral authority of the papacy and the political governance authority of temporal leaders. The understanding was that they both had their own order or their sphere of influence and expertise and power and that they should stick within that realm of influence, which is basically how they managed to coexist for so long when in fact they did get along. In their mutual partnership for control of the populace, they sometimes, however, exercised authority cooperatively, but at other times they were often in conflict from competitions for power. So in such competitions, the Holy See addressed this problem by asserting that its religious moral order was above and beyond the temporal political order, essentially that spiritual authority was supreme. As declared by the Holy See, this moral order supremacy flows directly from its heavenly source rooted in the divine. And according to the Holy See, the Christian deity is the ultimate and preeminent authority over the universe, and conveniently, the Roman Pope is considered the singular mouthpiece for that divine wisdom on earth. So this primary formula that the Holy See used is based on the church's coveted doctrine called the Petrine Primacy, which essentially hands supreme moral authority to the Pope to dictate directives to political authority. The success of this dogma throughout the medieval period relies on sourcing its ultimate power in the divine, which not only is, <clears throat> excuse me, a mystically elusive power, but essentially it's unassailable and ultimately it's unknowable, thereby making it quite effective. Excuse me. This created a form of authority that is steeped in an elusive and charismatic power that the Holy See used opportunistically to its advantage in competitions with governance authority, who after all were just mere mortals. So with this historical background in mind, we can now understand the following behavior. When the Holy See conducts its business in the modern UN setting, and it confronts <clears throat> views or policies that it opposes, the Holy See judiciously asserts the same type of ancient dogma as a tool of soft power. It subtly and cogently reminds the UN of the Holy See's supreme moral authority and it issues directives recalling its age old spiritual wisdom and admonishes the UN for its errant and destructive ways. It does this based on its ancient formula for cultivating and retaining power, which has been a successful method for surmounting the authority of its competitors for a few thousand years. So back to the Holy See's objectives. We can see now that the Holy See seeks acknowledgement as the UN's universal voice of moral authority. Its goal is to place the moral order above the global political order of the United Nations, modeling it on its ancient religious doctrine. In essence, it advances the idea that it operates as a supreme moral guide to the UN's political authority, which is inescapably based on anxious, ancient religious doctrine. In some, these objectives are patterned on the execution of the same strategy used in its past with empire as a tool for institutional survival. The Holy See perceives UN involvement as a moral authority actor as the best avenue to re remain relevant and to preserve power in the most prominent world form today in global governance. It chooses this primary status as an authority actor 
because it recognizes that there are many more benefits to acknowledgement as an authority actor than there are with recognition as an inconsequential state with no hard mechanisms of power. So next, I, I want to say something about methodology here. Um, essentially, the empirical evidence of my research dictated my theory. Um, we find an interesting methodological fact surfaces when we unpack this research process. We see that early and close observation of the research documents informed what turned out to be the appropriate theater theoretical basis for describing the Holy See's activity in the United Nations. In my case, the evidence indicated that the use of authority theory worked best for unraveling the Holy See's UN objectives rather than using legal personality. So consequently, after a thorough review of my documents um, and a sideline delve into history, my research decidedly took on uh, a turn toward examining scholarship on authority theory instead of legal personality. And this consequently opened up a window onto a very comprehensive description and understanding of the Holy See's UN activity, which really clearly explained uh, why it seemed to be so interested in forming a partnership with the United Nations International Political Authority and why it prefers this recognition over its statehood identification. So this reorientation to my research on authority theory resulted in a rather unexpected, but a very valuable side endeavor. Um, knowing little about authority theory, uh, it caused me to go down the proverbial rabbit hole in order to understand the various descriptions of authority from several disciplines. And in the process, I began to categorize authority elements or at least those characteristics that were described in the literature as most prominent. This resulted in establishing a classification system for authorities requisite elements, which illustrates how these characteristics interact as a means of generating compliance by authority actors, such as United Nations and the Holy See. The system of classification I created constitutes a method for identifying authorities elements that takes on the form of a simple algebraic equation, which I list here only for curiosity's sake, as there's no time, of course, to delve into its specifics. But essentially, it's a meta theory of sorts for authorities cultivation and retention. With this newfound theory of authority and taking into account its historical um, relationships with empire, the Holy See's UN activity and its objectives became quite clear to me. Um, the reliance on authority, the authority theory seemed to accurately provide the proper analytical basis for interpreting the Holy See's discourse that I found in my research documents. So, what I learned from authority theory was that based on this theory, the Holy See is best described as a transnational moral authority actor who attempts to replicate its ancient partnerships with political authority who together ruled over the empire in ancient times. The Holy See chooses to replicate this authority model in order to remain relevant in a world order of rising institutions of global governance in the UN. And this is, uh, of course, um, something that's quite familiar to the Holy See, given its history. So its conduct can be described as operating in a realm of higher authority that's above and beyond the level of states, which is sometimes referred to as a post-national realm of higher authority, which includes the UN's international political authority which is formally established in the UN Charter and agreed to by member states. But because the Holy See's moral authority is derived from outside of the realm of any formally established legal structures, such as the UN Charter or any other rule of law mechanisms, the Holy See's higher authority is referred to differently than the UN's charter-based international authority. 
The Holy See's authority is thus considered a form of higher authority that's cultivated from informal mechanisms versus the UN's formal mechanisms. So to highlight the broad international character of the Holy See's moral reach, but still distinguish it from the UN's, it's instead best considered to be a transnational moral authority actor, yet who functions in the UN in collaboration with the UN's political authority. So what do these two actors collaborate on? It's based on the fact that they share a duty to provide human security and protection worldwide, which is a mission that's claimed by both authority actors in the UN. The UN as an international authority has a political mission to provide international peace and security that's dictated in the charter. It's a rule of law principle that's established in the charter and it's the stated reason for the UN's existence. But the Holy See as well maintains an ancient moral mandate of humanitarian protection and peace which was delivered to the first Pope a few thousand years ago by the Christian deity. And the Holy See also declares this as the reason for its existence. So we have a situation where both actors share a complementary mission, but they act from different authority platforms. Resting upon transnational legal authority scholarship, this UN partnership in humanitarian concerns can be described is a coexisting and an interreliant plural authority relationship. This plural authority partnership acts together in a complementary fashion to bolster the legitimacy that's needed to carry out their mandated task of protecting humanity. And indeed, what we see in the documents uh, reflects that there is recognition of the shared responsibility to protect humanity and there is an effort to combine their forces of their mutual authority, the spiritual and the political in an effort to satisfy their mutual mission. There's an interesting unanswered question, which I didn't address in my research, but could be the topic possibly of another study. Uh, and that is whether this shared mission somehow can explain why the UN and the member states of the UN largely condone the Holy See's bold assumption of this higher moral authority activity in the UN. Is this permissive license by the UN the result of a cost benefit analysis that it does where the UN reveres the Pope and permits the Holy See to claim such singular moral authority status where other religions are not given the same standing? Does the UN see the Holy See's activity as augmenting its own legitimacy so that in balance, it turns a blind eye to the obvious religious nature of the Holy See's dogma, finding it more beneficial to not challenge its highly unusual status in the UN? Uh, a question uh, possibly for another discussion. So in uh, my conclusions, um, I'd like to look at um, what can we make of this research uh, of the Holy See's conduct in the UN? Um, first, I'll briefly address the issue of methodology. Um, what I mean in this first bullet point um, about letting the tail wag the dog is that Sometimes it's best to allow the empiricism to direct the theoretical basis that is used for interpreting evidence rather than assuming a strict legal analysis. The lesson is that in terms of methodology, we can see that it's critical to interpret empirical evidence with the proper analytical tools. When the initial review of evidence showed no correlation with the Holy See's reliance on sovereignty or on legal personality to explain its prominent activity in the UN as a moral actor. I broadened my review of the Holy See's discourse in the documents and I found its focus was on prominent public, prominently publicizing its moral authority status instead. So in this case, limiting my approach to analyzing data solely based on legal personality would have caused me to miss the important clues that were offered by the broader transdisciplinary perspective 
which was eventually furnished by transnational legal theory of authority and importantly, including history. This approach allowed for the inclusion of other evidence, which was taken from the Holy See's um, ancient relationships cultivated uh, with empire and as used as an effective means of developing its authority and its power throughout the medieval period, as well as it uh, allowed me to see the use of primacy dogma as a means to surmount the authority of its political imperial uh, competitors. This angle then allowed this, these historical patterns to be readily identified when they were observed in the modern Holy See discourse as efforts to cultivate a similar authority partnership in the United Nations setting. So to switch from methodology, the next important takeaway is that the Holy See relies on the same durable formula to cultivate and to maintain authority that it's consistently used for two millennia. And it does this for a very good reason, because it works. It's an effective, strategy because it's rooted in an appealing and a charismatic type of authority, which presents an elusive justification for its preeminent moral standing, which is near impossible to challenge given that it's of a divine nature. In examining the implications of this research study, there's an interesting quote by Sir Darcy Osborne, who was the, the British envoy to the Holy See, during World War II, who made the following observation. The Pope and his advisors do not consider and resolve problems solely in light of temporary and obvious facts. Their approach is by habit and long tradition, which is unlimited in space and time. They reckon centuries and they plan for eternity, which inevitably renders their policies confusing, inscrutable, and often reprehensible to practical and conditioned minds. So Osborne provides us with a practical reminder of the ancient disposition and the consistent dogmatic policies of the Roman papacy as the basis for its successful practices with its impressive ability to adapt through the centuries. Yet it has an enduring observance of doctrine and this doctrine has been a vital feature to the Holy See's success as the oldest institution in history. But this traditional formulaic policy needs maintenance, especially in the increasingly cosmopolitan and secularized world in which we live, which the current Pope wisely understands. Pope Francis clearly comprehends that the institution's survival relies on the sustained ability to generate charismatic appeal in the papacy and in the eyes of the public in order to preserve reverence and thus its legitimacy of its moral voice. So in the modern UN forum, the Holy See's adaptability uses the same expression of preeminence of the moral order over the political order to direct its policy decisions that are favorable to the survival of the Holy See in our global world. So in conclusion, um, the religious institution regards UN engagement as an avenue for the successful restoration of its broad jurisdictional authority that popes actually once exercised with empire throughout the era of Christendom. The papacy envisions the UN is a promising form for the establishment of a similar universal public authority to which it can dispense preeminent moral directives. So why is this a problem? In the present era of globalization and with the weakening of sovereign borders, this authority arrangement is presently recognized by the papacy as significantly more promising for the acquisition of future power than the meager benefits that could possibly accrue from identification in the UN is a small inconsequential state. The research clearly demonstrates that the Holy See has assumed a public function in the UN as a moral authority agent. And as an issue of legal theory, 
The Holy See assumed role indicates that the UN has endorsed it as a transnational moral authority actor for all of humanity. But as we've seen, this position is indispensably reliant upon an ancient religious primacy doctrine that presently aims to direct the course of international public authority behavior, which is intended by the Holy See as a mechanism to secure its own personal future power. The problem surfaces when one considers that the creation of the United Nations is based on an intergovernmental attempt to create a framework for peace, which is based in the decidedly secular principles of the UN Charter. And although no one can argue that there is always a need for moral leadership in the United Nations, it is indeed irrefutable that the Holy See's particular assumption of such authority is deeply rooted in religion and steeped in the ancient practices of Western Christianity in particular. It can be argued that this special status simply as a matter of fairness and of equal standing among member states of the UN should reasonably be subject to scrutiny. It invites the question of why the UN has anointed one particular religion as the primary voice of moral authority as it could provoke religious competition in the UN forum in the future. And such standing should invite critical analysis because there are indeed deeper and broader implications to this reality. Well, this uh, brings the end to my discussion and um, I believe we can now open this up to conversation and I'll hand this back to Anki. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both our speakers for the succulent presentation and uh, perhaps to the force of what this institution is, perhaps even if you can classify it as an institution, perhaps it's the safest word which you can use for it. There are a few questions which I would like to pose to both our speakers. Uh, and uh, uh, just as a side note, the authority theory seems like a wonderful, wonderful tool to not only study the Holy See but other things as well. So I would uh, nudge Dr. Mills to speak about that as well. But the first question which I'd like to pose is in the past few days one was one reflected and, and, and uh, spent time watching a wonderful, wonderful movie on Kaiser Wilhelm and how after after he was overthrown he, uh, he moved into the uh, Dutch hills and uh, uh, Herr Himmler had gone to visit him and there was a there was a point which at which the 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 empress spoke to uh, to to kaiser william the third when she said that you will perhaps be sent back to rule uh, the german kingdom or whatever one would make of it and a sense or a direct reference on means to rule by god's rule so what i'm trying to pose is understanding the divinity of rule and how it would relate to the Vatican City. So then does the Vatican City become a representation of the divine rule? And how does that stand in the face of those rulers who say that they have a direct anointment, as you said, by, by, by God himself? So where does the Holy See or the Vatican City sit in that, in that discourse or perhaps, let's say, spectrum? The second question which I would like to pose is... Uh, what what remains the feel or let's say the perspective on a sort of a internal coach to avoid all sorts of discussions on immunity like let's say for instance if you juxtapose this to a, a military tribunal or a or a army uh, system wherein they're only tried by army officials it's a closed knit system and the, no sort of civilians are welcomed into uh, at least participating in this perhaps can be witness to it so what remains the feel or an internal disco internal system to to uh, to adjudicate these persons for for whatever crimes they might have committed assuming that there have been any criminal charges or there is any wage to these criminal charges I'll stop there for now um perhaps I'll address the the first one um as I understand it um uh, two things um, jump into my mind. Um, the, the first, um, the, as uh, 
Cedric mentioned, and I concur with, uh, the Vatican is really a bureaucratic entity that functions solely as um, a bureaucracy. It, it, it is, however, um, built on a monarchical model. Uh, and so, as Cedric said, they, they deal with the nuts and bolts. They don't deal with the spiritual mission of the international organization or transnational organization. Um, and so I, I, my sense is, is that, you know, we see these monarchical uh, states that have an additional aspect sometimes of their authority, which is derived not just from formal authority, um, constitutionally derived, but from a different type of authority that is informal, that derives more from uh, a charismatic um, uh, authority. And I think the Vatican has a little bit of both. It acts strictly as a bureaucratic, more formal authority because the fact that it is recognized as a state. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that is an interesting aspect of my research that I do go into um, in reference to authority theory, dividing it into two different types of authority, um, one being more legal and constituted informal and one being more informal. Cedric, do you have anything more to add to that? <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot, Sharon. I, I'll uh, pick up the, the second question then, uh, uh, which um, Ankit uh, posed. Um, so Ankit, you had a reference to uh, a milita military tribunal, and you also started with a reference, by the way, to uh, Kaiser Wilhelm, also in his military context, indeed. Um, he found refuge uh, very close to the city where, where I am now located in Utrecht. So it's just a uh, a couple of miles outside of Utrecht at the castle of Dorn. Um, and, um, well, he found refuge here because he was uh, related uh, to, at the time, the Queen uh, of, of the Netherlands. I mean, I think they were, uh, the, the, the Kaiser was the, 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 the cousin or something uh, of, of, of the Queen of the Netherlands. But, uh, and the Netherlands was uh, neutral, obviously, during the First World War. Regardless, you refer to, to military Tribunals now. Military tribunals have jurisdiction over individuals, um, and and maybe that is then the question: um, Is there um, jurisdiction over individual or individual representatives of the Catholic Church? And the easy answer is yes. I mean, it's quite straightforward uh, that bishops, clergymen can individually be prosecuted. Also, a diocese dioces can be sued civilly. Uh, and as has happened in the United States, Sharon, you may know more about that, but uh, some dioceses were, were bankrupted as a, as a result of, of, of litigation um, uh, by, by plaintiffs. Um, so, but the question that I, I was concerned with was whether the, the Holy See as a separate legal entity being at the apex of the Catholic Church, whether that entity could be uh, prosecuted uh, or sued. Now, um, one of the um, reasons for dismissal of the case before the European Court of Human Rights and also before the Court of Appeal in Belgium was that the court said, well, you have an alternative, right? You could always sue the bishop. You could sue the individual clergymen. There were issues, of course, with statutes of limitation. So many of these bishops and clergymen could escape suit or prosecution because it happened like in the 70s. Uh, and that was too long ago so they could then retire. So there was no possibility. So that's why you may also want to sue uh, the, the, the Holy See as such, as I said, as the nerve center, uh, which may be ultimately responsible. And that's really a separate remedy for an individual to sue the Holy See, as opposed to suing um, an individual person based on, on a code of silence, which has since the 1960s 
been uh, propagated um, uh, by the Holy See. So this is why I was a bit um, disappointed. Well, the good thing is, of course, that the court said, well, there are alternative remedies. Uh, and Ankit, I agree with you. These alternative remedies might be there. You could, uh, uh, like military tribunals, you go, could go after uh, individual persons. But the question is whether that um, is enough, also simply from a pecuniary uh, perspective, uh, the, the, the pockets of the Holy See might, of course, be deeper than the pockets of an individual clergyman. Eh? So there's a, a level of opportunism here um, on behalf of the plaintiffs, too. Um, but still, I mean, the, the door has now been closed um, by the European court, has been closed in the United States as well. Uh, so I'm not overly optimistic uh, for justice uh, to be done here. Let me let me also share screens since both our speakers did it. And I do this for the specific purpose of highlighting an article which I found rather useful while preparing for this uh, discussion. I, I just need to see how one can do that. So, uh, right. I, and I share this as a specific part of an article which was written on opinion juries. And uh, the wonderful editors over there were kind enough to accept this uh, from from a student. But but this is what I really want to share. Um, and I read this out just for just for the sake of clarity to everyone. Uh, earlier this year, one of the Polish newspapers informed about an instruction addressed to Polish bishops. The instructions issued by the Holy See. The instructions prevents Polish bishops and the superiors of religious orders from divulging into to the Polish authorities, the records of canons, canon law proceedings in cases of child sexual abuse committed by the members of the Catholic clergy. This was justified by the fact that these proceedings are within an exclusive jurisdiction of the Congregation for the Doctrine of, of Faith and are carried out by the local churches upon its request. From now on, the Polish authorities may only try to obtain these documents directly from the Holy See via the request for the in international legal cooperation. The instruction will restrain access to evidence against specific perpetrators of sexual abuse and may limit the possibilities to uncover those responsible for their systematic cover-up. As a result, the author says, the instruction may prevent Poland from fully complying with its obligations under the UN Convention on the Project on uh, rights of child to effectively investigate and prosecute sexual offenses against children. This is paradoxical given the, that the same obligation is binding on the Holy See which ratified the convention in 1990. The instructions for the Polish bishop reminds, the, reminds us of the ambiguities surrounding the legal status of the Holy See as the subject of international law, the nature of its relations with local churches and the scope of its obligations under the human rights treaties that it has ratified. I now pause, uh, turn back to our speakers to share their perspectives on the three uh, questions with which the, the, the author ends as to the legal status of the Holy See as a subject of international law, the nature of its relationships with local churches, and I request them to pay more emphasis to this part of the question and also the obligations it has and does it in some sense hold a responsibility which is larger than than just uh, those which are under them or sort of being the moral uh, figure to to shepherd them towards uh, this moral righteousness sorry that went on for a while but uh, either one who would be interested to take a uh, jab at this I believe that's Cedric's jurisdiction. <laughs> I haven't uh, read that um, blog post. It's really interesting. Also coming from Poland, obviously, uh, where uh, Catholic Church is uh, still very strong and to a certain extent this is all supported by the government itself. So you see also a link uh, between um, uh, the religious and the secular here. Uh, so going back in a way to uh, to, to, to earlier times. Um, yeah, um, uh, indeed, uh, the difficult legal status, uh, the Holy See with the universal um, uh, remit. Um, there's an interesting article as well that was published in the Duke Journal by William Worcester uh, on, on human rights obligations and, and the question of, um, of jurisdiction in which the author applied this concept of, of extraterritoriality, extraterritorial jurisdiction 
to a non-state actor building indeed uh, upon the very fact that the Holy See um, or the Vatican City is a party to uh, the Convention on, on the Rights um, uh, of the Child. Uh, so that uh, the idea is then that uh, the Holy See has in a way jurisdiction over the flock um, of Catholics, not necessarily in terms of like the territorial model of jurisdiction, but more the personal model uh, of jurisdiction uh, because they are also subject to the jurisdiction via canon law, um, as you referred to Ankit. Um, I was just indeed um, having a look right before this meeting on, on this principle agent relationship between um, the Holy See and bishops, clergymen and so on. So what does canon law say? exactly on this. There is a report in 2014 by the Committee on the Rights of the Child, which draws attention uh, to Canon 331 and Canon 598. And there you can see that 331 says a bishop of the Roman church, the bishop of the Roman church here um, is, is, is the pontifex, is, is, is the pope. Um, uh, is the head of the College of Bishops, the Vicar of Christ, and the pastor of the Universal Church um, on Earth, and possess the supreme, full, immediate, and universal ordinary power in the church. So this is what I would call uh, some kind of universal jurisdiction um, over Catholics. And you see a certain tension, of course, with secular law. When crimes are committed, uh, well, normally when it's a non-state actor, um, uh, you, you have jurisdiction over the non-state actor that is territorially present on your territory. And there's a tension here with, in a way, a state within the state, uh, the Catholic Church, which claims certain prerogatives um, for itself. And uh, as I read it, but that was not uh, something that I was fully aware of, that not all these records and documents are shared uh, so that it also becomes a bit difficult then, I think, for state prosecutors uh, to take up the case or for victims to file, uh, file civil suits if they don't have access uh, to internal proceedings. Uh, has, has the court been serious um, about this? Now, at the same time, I would say, um, if the court has been serious uh, about this under its own internal proceedings, that could be a reason to dismiss immunity uh, or to uphold immunity, um, I would say. That is something that is also part of the European Court of Human Rights um, framework, uh, contingent immunity, if there is a reasonable alternative remedy available, if there's an internal proceedings proceeding within the Catholic Church, and it was, well, more or less okay, uh, then you can cite that um, as an argument uh, to deny uh, or to uphold um, immunity. But I would need to look more into that uh, that's always this tension um, between what uh, Sharon also said, the strategic use of international legal personality uh, by the Holy See, a certain opportunism with the Holy See claiming certain rights and privileges like immunities, like participation in various international bodies, but at the same time trying to evade its responsibilities, for instance, under human rights treaties and obligations. But in the face of such affairs, and I'll turn to Dr. Mills, in the face of such affairs and such news coming out, how much of an effect does it have on the potency of the Holy See at the UN in terms of, in terms of its, let's say, national interests or points which it wants to further for protection of its uh, objectives? I, I, so you're asking what whether this this type of dialogue has an impact in the Holy See? You know, I, I am going to say I don't I don't see much evidence that it has. Um, you know, reviewing almost uh, the entirety of the the Holy See's discourse in the UN since it entered uh, that relates to either authority theory or. Uh, to liability for any type of wrongs, um, the Holy See steadfast uh, maintains its presence based on its its doctrines, which it will, as Cedric said, it will, it, it will pick and choose which identity it selects for each individual fact inquiry that 
seems to surface in the UN. And it seems to be quite effective at bypassing uh, scrutiny, um, you know, in, in situations um, with liability for sex abuse cases. Um, it has readily uh, used immunity to uh, defend and um, in situations where it, it finds that statehood identification is useful, uh, it certainly will assert that. Um, and my research shows it's, it's in the two situations when it needs the privileges of statehood, uh, such as immunity, and when it needs to remind the UN of its um, sovereign its sovereignty uh, based on its religious freedom to exercise its mission. Right. Thank you. Uh, we've we've come to the close of the session. I'd like to once again thank our both our speakers for taking our time to do this and also sharing these thought provoking thought uh, thought provoking perspectives and. I now invite them just to say final words, following which we will close. Uh, Professor, Professor Rangard, then we'll have Dr. Mills, and then we can close. So final words. I can only say thanks a lot for, uh, for the invitation, um, and, and thanks a lot also uh, for, for sharing your thoughts um, as a chair. I also um, learned uh, quite a bit um, uh, today, but, but I think what Sharon uh, said towards the uh, end of our presentation, um, this invitation for, for a deeper critical uh, analysis on, on, on the position um, of the Holy See um, within the United Nations, I believe, is overdue. With. Probably the Catholic Church is a religion that is boxing a bit um, above its weight in international relations, and that's a consequence of this special legal status that it has acquired over the centuries. Now, if you compare that to other religions, uh, the, the Muslim religion, for instance, they have more than 2 billion adherents, but simply because they're organized in a less centralized manner, they're far less represented. Uh, of course, there are a number of non-governmental groups which have observer status as a non-state actor, as an NGO um, at the United Nations, but it's not the same as the observer status of the United Nations. And the same applies to the Hindu religion, as I understand it, there are more than 1 billion Hindus, and that's about 15% of the global population. To what extent are they represented in international affairs? I have a question mark. I don't have an answer to that. I haven't looked into that, but I think it's reason for concern. Thank you once again, Ankit, for welcoming me to be part of this lecture series, which is quite impressive that you have uh, set up such uh, an interesting panel of people. Um, and I want to uh, echo what Cedric said. I, I, I think a major concern, and it should be uh, emphasized um, within the UN, um, you know, not only are there many issues that the UN needs to address in terms of reform, uh, I fear that one of the most important could eventually surface with this special uh, sui generis status of the Holy See in the UN could eventually invite religious conflict you know, within the UN forum for uh, very obvious reasons, um, given the inequality that uh, is facially apparent with this status. Indeed. Uh, with those words, I thank all our speakers and also our participants for taking our time to do this. It's been a riveting discussion and one, one is deeply inspired and motivated by not only the work, but also the teachings and also the writings of our respected speakers. Thank you once again. And I wish them a good afternoon and from my end, a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.